Welcome to the Artistic Finance Podcast, where we break down the wall between art and money. If you're here looking for how to be an artist and financially sustain a career, you're in the right place. Keep listening and join us as we learn about artists and how they make money work for them. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Ethan Steinel, here for episode 44. Thank you for being here, and a special thank you to my Patreon patrons who get the shows early and with extra content. The additional audio from today's interview, where we talk about design and a nice story from the Redditors versus Hedge Funds ordeal, is over at Patreon. If you want to support me and the show, do that at patreon.com slash artistic finance. Today's show focuses on how to organize and itemize receipts for tax time. If you're outside of the USA or if you don't itemize your taxes, that part of today's episode will not apply to you. Itemization is something that trips up freelancers. If it trips you up, you'll be more inclined to avoid learning about it. But I'm here to explain that it isn't as complicated as we imagine it to be. In today's interview, we go line by line through the actual list of itemized categories that we use for our taxes. I'll be honest, it makes for a boring 15 minutes of audio. But if you can stick it out, you'll know every single area that you can deduct. It can be overwhelming if you don't know, but once we make it through the 25 items, you'll realize that that is all there is to it. Nothing to be intimidated by. Today's guest is Corey Paddock, a theatrical lighting designer whose New York designs include Final Follies at Primary Stages and Stalking the Boogeyman at New World Stages. He designed the U.S. national tour of Flashdance the Musical, In the Heights at the Kennedy Center, and Footloose for Norwegian Cruise Line. He has designed Sunset Boulevard in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and has been the associate or assistant on six Broadway shows. He is the host and creator of In One the Podcast, featuring interviews with theatrical designers available at inonepodcast.com. And here's a bit of trivia for anyone not familiar with theater terminology. In a classic proscenium theater, the stage is framed by a portal. Then, going upstage away from the audience, you'll have a second portal and a third portal. So the space between the first set of portals is called in one. The space between the second set of portals is in two. This allows for succinct communication during a workday. So instead of saying, down there, in the corner, closest to the audience, you can shorten it to say, in one right or in one left. So there you have it. Who says you only have to learn about finance on this show? That's a little bit of artistic knowledge for you. As always, links to everything we talk about are in the show notes and on our website, artisticfinance.com. And one favor before we start the show, which is to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or on any podcast app. The subscribers are our best metric for how we're doing at sustaining our listenership. So if you would be so kind, please subscribe. And without further ado, let's get to our interview. Welcome, Corey Paddock, to the podcast. Hi. We are recording this on February 2nd, 2021. So we are amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, and then we're also amidst the Black Lives Matter slow burn in the United States, but also across the world. That's where we are. Could you tell us how you got into your profession and where you are now in your career? Uh, I'm in my living room in (laughs) New York, uh, uh, not really having a career, (laughs) as you mentioned. Uh, I'm a lighting designer. I work mainly in theater. I got, uh, I was an actor for most of my childhood uh, through high school. Shifted when I went to college to design as opposed to performance and then studied lighting design at Syracuse University. Got a BFA there. After Syracuse, went back to Pittsburgh where I'm from for like nine months to kind of just like work a lot in Pittsburgh, live at home, rent free. There's a lot of theater in Pittsburgh, so I got some real credits and and got my feet wet doing this and then moved to New York in 2006. And I have been in New York uh, ever since. Okay, I have to go back about the child actor thing. <laughs> so when you say you were a child actor, because I mean, when I was in high school, every male that was in the theater department got cast in every single show if they wanted. So I was an actor technically. But when you say you were a child actor, like, were you doing like TV ads or what What? What scale was this? Yeah, I mean, it was a little more. I mean, yes, I was doing the musical in high school typically in a 
some sort of principal role. <laughs> um, but I was doing a lot of stuff outside of school. I was I was working with a professional company in Pittsburgh, which is now called Pittsburgh Musical Theater. Um, they went through a couple name changes. Uh, and so I would do, I would work on shows with them as like a non-equity sort of young actor. I would do sort of a random commercial here and there. I did one little film that shot in Pittsburgh with like a really small thing. Um, so yeah, I thought that's what I wanted to do. Okay, so that's a good transition to me asking about In One, the podcast, which you've now run for seven years or hosted for seven years. Yeah, I mean, the first episode came out January of 2014. I would say ours are not so different in the sense of we're both theater, we're both lighting, and we talk to a lot of designers. These are talking to artists, fine artists, opera singers, things like that, which is great. Um, mine is specifically designers. On the rare occasion, we'll have like a director or a stage manager or a programmer or someone sort of on the peripheral, but generally it's all sort of lighting, scenic, costume, uh, uh, projection, makeup, hair, you know, those sort of the props, you know, this sort of design. So I would recommend anybody who's interested in theater design to go listen to your podcast because I'll get off on tangents that have nothing to do with money, <laughs> but because I'm talking to other designers, we'll go off on all these long tangents that are boring to probably most of the people. <laughs> and so I'll often put them in my Patreon and stuff. If you want all that stuff, just go listen to Corey's podcast where they don't talk about money all the time. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we ever talk about money. Talking about money is a dicey thing, which is A, why I'm so glad your podcast exists and B, why I'm so happy to be here doing it because I am a huge proponent of talking about money and I don't think we do it enough and I think it's extremely detrimental and harmful to the people in the industry that we don't talk about money enough. You know, at least your podcast is set up in a format that people know they're coming on to talk about money and they're either sort of on board or not. In my thing, it would be weird to just tangent to be like, so tell me about your 1099. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, yeah, it, yeah. I, I, I try to stay away from that. Well, what you were saying was it's a weird time to be talking about design because we're not doing it right now. I have had a number of people tell me like, Ethan, you know, check back with me in a year or two because I'll talk with you about money, but I just don't want to do it right now because the world is in turmoil. See, I get that. But I also think that for the people who haven't been talking, Ken made this point on your episode, that there's sort of two groups of people right now. There's like people who are like financially stable as of March of 2020 and, and are able to weather this. And perhaps those that are struggling more. It's like 911, like we have to talk about money right now. You may be su suffering the consequences of it as soon as possible. You need to sort of like, as best as you can, uh, understanding sort of privilege and, and support and where we where everyone is in their own lives like if you feel like you don't have your shit together in terms of money you need to like get on that right now because you have a real world example of what can happen if, like we have a great example we're living in it right now as to why this matters things like having a savings matter the best time to convince people that this is important is as they're sort of suffering through the consequences of it so i think it's a, i think it's a better better late than never right that's true and i also think it's timeless because a number of people think oh, you started this in pandemic, you're here to talk to people through the pandemic. And it's like, no, no, I just happened to have the time and started it during pandemic. So if you learn how to save, how to open your retirement account, learn about your pension plan, it's not going to change when we get out of pandemic. You may not have a lot of money right now to do anything with it, but what you have is time. Some of these things just take time, like establishing a system and like re-engineered part of my financial system in this time simply because I had the time to do it. You're not, you're not, you don't have eight shows at the moment. You can sit down, look at your financial life and go like, okay, what do you know, what am I doing? Yeah. So anyway, that being said, could you describe your demographics to us? Yes, I am a, a white male. I would say I'm culturally Jewish, <laughs> which is to say I was raised Jewish, but probably haven't set foot in a temple since my bar mitzvah. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm very boring. I'm a <laughs> white Jewish male in theater. You could throw a stick. Yeah. How old are you? Uh, I'm 37. Relationship status? You don't have to share if you don't want? Yes. No. You know my girlfriend well, Darby. Uh, uh, we've been together for... How long have we been together? <laughs> Wait. Uh, you can't ask her that. You have to know that. <laughs> I think we're in our seventh year now. Uh, well, congratulations. Uh, that's cool. Um, yes. Uh, and so uh, that's very wonderful and we're very happy. Okay. So now your creative personality... What is a live event that you like to experience as an audience member? Well, I love musical theater, which is like the thing that I do the most and sort of the thing that I, uh, what got me into this. 
I love Cirque du Soleil. I love Cirque du Soleil style shows. The, all those shows in Vegas and Dubai and Macau and those like massive kajillion dollar spectacles with flying and fire. I love those and I, I would love to do one of those. And then here's a, here's an answer that that no one will ever give you, I'm sure. I love like dark rides. Is that a live entertainment? Yeah. There's something so exciting to me about being in like a little buggy and going through like an environment that has scenic design and lighting and video and interaction. You know where there's like old carnival dark rides that would like come in on like a flatbed and you could only see the car as it came around in the loading area and then it would like go through a pair of like old timey doors and then you didn't know what was happening inside and maybe there was black light i love the the mystery of like what's inside that like live haunted house with like theatrical elements to it i'd love to design something like that too i I love that what is a piece of art that you like sherlock the bbc series have you seen sherlock Mm -hmm. i can't tell you the number of times that i referenced sherlock talking about composition and like transitions on stage and actually the show we did stalking the boogeyman that was like a big reference point where it was like if you go back and watch episodes of sherlock they do this thing where like they layer in and out of scenes the editing is unbelievable and instead of just like cutting from one scene to another they'll sort of bring in the foreground of the next scene with the old background and then like wipe in the old background or Sherlock and Watson will be like sitting in their living room and then like the camera will pan around 180 degrees and suddenly the other side of their living room, like the fourth wall has been blown out and it's like a, it's like a London street. And then suddenly this chairs they're sitting in are in the middle of the street and then they get, and I think, I think that's so applicable to really interesting stage design and transitioning and the number of times, especially in musicals where you've got like characters kind of walking from one scene to another or how you kind of, dovetail from one location to another and how you can sort of overlap elements with lighting you know you can you can have a character finishing a scene and then you you build the practical for the next location first as the character that's exiting they leave their light goes out and then more light but that idea of sort of like overlapping and weaving of location and storytelling i i reference that show the editing in that show all the time i don't know that's a that's a piece of art that i think about a lot Onto your financial personality, are you good or bad with money? Um, I think I'm pretty good. Have you always been good or did you become good during this pandemic? So my dad is really, really good with money. And the reason my dad is really good with money is because my dad's dad, my grandfather, died when my dad was like 10 years old. For the majority of my dad's teenage years, it was him and, and my uncle, two brothers, with a single mother living in like a very sort of small split level sort of home. Super middle class. She had like a government job. Both my dad and my uncle went to college in the city, I believe, and lived at home. So money was pretty tight when my dad was growing up. They learned to live very close to their means and live uh, and not spend a lot. My dad wanted to make sure that his family didn't necessarily have to feel like that or ever, you know, or ever be in a situation where where they were sort of living that tight. He's never like worked in the financial world, but always been very smart about saving, about money, about instilling in me saving and being careful what you spend. That has carried into my adult life. Now, I will say my dad goes too far. He doesn't spend enough. You only get one life on this planet and you need to you need to enjoy it and you need to live it. If you have money, sometimes you can do things with that money to create joy in your life. And if you only keep that money in the bank or you only use it for utilitarian things like paying for gas bills and, you know, insurance, are you truly living life to the fullest? What I've tried to do is find a balance between the way my dad functions which is like very very tight per strings not a lot of spending on yourself and then the opposite of that which is just sort of like you know spending a ton i'll spend money on something whether it's a purchase or a vacation you know i know you and your wife you guys travel a lot like we don't travel quite as much but when we do you know obviously it's for pleasure it's for joy i travel a ton for work and so it's important to sometimes set aside travel for pleasure my dad is sometimes 
little bit like, wow, that, that, that's going to cost you a lot. You know, should you be saving that? And it's like, look, I want to, I want to ex- experience the world. I want to experience culture and food in in other countries and other continents. And I can do it without sort of like going broke. And so I'm going to do that. So I've tried to find that balance. It's a constant struggle with myself and a constant conversation with my dad to justify some of those spendings. You know, aside from like when you see your parents and they like hand you some money, you know, to go buy ice cream or whatever, you know, I don't like get normal payments from my parents. I'm self-sufficient. Oh, so you get irregular payments then. No. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, oh, come on. Like if you go visit and like your dad gives you a hug and he hands you like, a little wad of cash, you know. That's never yeah, happened but, to me, but uh, okay. <laughs> uh, point, you, you should go see my parents. Yes. <laughs> no, but my point is like the older that I get and the longer that I'm like a professional artist making a living being an artist, there's less opportunity for my dad to go like, well, you don't know what you're doing because like, well, it's like I kind of been doing it for like 15 years and like it's kind of going okay. So like I might actually know what I'm doing and I might actually have a pretty good balance how much money I'm spending and how much money is coming in. He has eased up a little bit because I think in his mind, he's going like, well, he's an adult and like, he doesn't come to us crying for money. So like, he must be doing something right. So who who are we to judge? So for for, for those reasons, I think I'm pretty good. If only because I never want to go to my parents and be like, I need money. Going back to your story of acting in childhood, where you said at some point I decided that it was too much trouble to work that life. And so I went into lighting. You work very hard as a lighting designer. I mean, we're talking a marginal difference here. One thing that I knew as an actor, because again, I watched sort of friends that were a year or two older than me go through this. I was never going to be like a leading man. Like, I don't look like Brad Pitt as an actor. The way you look, how tall you are, what color your hair is, so much of that affects how much you're able to work. But as a lighting designer or a designer, generally nobody cares really what you look like. I mean, you should be presentable. I never liked the idea that as an actor, you could work really, really hard and not get the job because you were like too short. That seemed not fair. And I didn't, I didn't want to experience that. I knew that it might be easier to get design jobs because it really was more just about the the talent and the skill and the personality as opposed to how you looked. I still knew it would, it would be a really hard way to make a living, but it was only like it was it was going to be fractionally easier. Also, because there are less designers than there are actors, so there's like less of us to go around. I mean, there's also less design jobs, I suppose, but it just felt like. Two percent less competitive than being an actor, and that that felt that felt like an edge that I I wanted. This fine line of spending too much for enjoyment versus saving for your future, because this is hard for everyone. I mean, it's easy for some people because some people are like, "Oh, just spend everything and live in the moment, and I'll figure it out." And then other people are like, "I'm gonna save." No matter what, I'm always going to have my nest egg, blah, blah, blah. I want to defend people like your dad. Oh, he would love it. Go ahead. So say you get to retirement age. You're 65, you're 70, and you've amassed $500,000. Now, at that point, you could go take a trip to Europe or you could go visit China. I think some people still are worried because it's like, well, I only have 500000 which is like plenty. But on the flip side, they're like, we don't want to spend 10000 on a trip. So they don't do it. And then they die, right? (laughs) And people are like, well, they had $400,000. They should have spent it, but they didn't. And I'm only defending that because the security that people cherish. You're a freelancer. I'm a freelancer. We're living in the Wild West, you know, no rules, no stability. Some people really value that stability. And so while we're like, well, they could have enjoyed a trip, a nice vacation. To them, that security is worth more than the experience. Absolutely. Where this gets trickier is like, so my parents are both retired. They both have a pretty good nest egg in terms of retirement. My mom does want to do that stuff. She wants to go on cruises and travel and do things. My dad is a little less, he's more reluctant to do that. Also, I'm an only child. Whatever money is left when my parents are no longer around will go to me. And my dad is constantly sort of reminding me of that in sort of like a joking way. Hey, if we spend it, then it's not there for you. And I'm like, look, I get that. And like, thank you for thinking of me like that. But also, please enjoy your your golden years. Like my parents went to Vegas for the first time a couple years ago. They both been wanting to go, but they just like never spent the money. And so they finally went and they had a great time and they want to go back. I mean, Cookie Jordan, she said, don't wait for your parents to die to get your money. They worked hard and earned their money. Let them spend it and enjoy themselves. You're working hard. You spend your stuff and enjoy yourself your way. Yeah, and I will say one thing that my that my dad doesn't very kindly makes a deposit into my IRA 
every year. He's not giving me money to have to spend, but he's essentially sort of like, you know, we also went through a strange thing recently, a couple, not a couple years ago, like quite some time ago where my grandmother, so his mother had like a stroke and or a series of strokes, which, which eventually landed her in a hospital and then in like a nursing home. For lack of a better word, she was like a vegetable. She was not really living. And she sort of went on that way for about a year before she eventually passed away. Essentially all the money she had, which was not a lot, you know, and her property, her, her house, her car went to sort of paying off the medical bill. And then eventually when that ran out, then the government, I believe, steps in and sort of starts picking up the tab. So let's say you have a really nice inheritance or you have a nest egg and something happens to you. It's quite possible that a lot of that money gets burned through for like end of life costs and is no longer necessarily available to offspring. So I think one of the reasons my dad does the IRA contributions, it's kind of like slowly moving a little bit of that money in anticipation of sort of an inheritance down the line, but locking it in an IRA. So I'm not touching it for decades anyways, as opposed to if something were to happen and all their money got run through by the government, then there'd sort of be like nothing left. Well, the other thing is IRA money can't be touched for a lot of things. Like if you do bankruptcy, you can still keep your IRA. Not that you're planning to declare bankruptcy. <laughs> But no, I, I like your dad. Your dad, I love that IRA. I mean, you know I'm a big fan of IRAs. I know. It's a Roth IRA, and he started it years ago. Sometimes if I am doing well and I want to move some money into savings, we'll have a conversation about, like, should I just move this into savings or, like, should we make an IRA deposit? Should we do, like, a like a short-term CD, which generally I haven't actually ended up doing because it never seems worth it for the amount of money I have to put in, which is not a lot. At the start of your career, so I guess when you moved to New York— what did your finances look like then? I was not sort of coming with zero. One of the reasons that I went home after college was to make money and live essentially rent-free, utility-free. I had a car that I had access to. My overhead was very, very low for like nine months. And so I was able to do, I mean, I probably did, you know, at least like a dozen jobs or something. I had, you know, a couple ways in college that I would make money. And so I had done that. It's crazy to think this, but like when I had done that like film, like way back in the early mid nineties, that was like the first time I had gotten sort of like substantial, I mean, substantial to a 12 year old. You know, I had a little bit of money and we like put it in an account and like not even being allowed to touch it, you know, was sort of like, oh, you can have a little bit of it, but, but we're putting the rest in savings. Amazingly, like movies send residuals and like, I mean, really, really shitty residuals. Uh, and I still get some for like literally 25 cents or two dollars or something so that that's not having an impact but like in the 90s it did and so there was a tiny little bit of money coming in from that so i didn't move to new york with a ton i moved with something that was enough i did have a survival job for a little bit but it paid really really poorly i used to like work concessions at various like theaters like for like roundabout theaters and, and like pour wine for rich patrons and make like six bucks an hour or something. And it was uh, it was flexible enough that I could still work design gigs. But yeah, so I had I had a little, which makes a big difference between a little and nothing. Okay, here's my concession at a theater story. I went to see a Broadway show. I went to get a glass of wine for me and my companion. And it was f like 44 bucks for two glasses of wine. Like, I knew it would be a lot, but come on, that's ridiculous. So here's a story from my concession days, which is that um, when I was living at home, I went to bartending school. My parents, but also, also me a little bit, like, thought, well, you better have some other skills that you could use to, like, make money. And, and I was like, oh, I could bartend at theaters. Well, that'll keep me in the building, you know, because, like, you know, people love hiring designers who work behind the bar. Right. <laughs> hey, you, come out here and, and come light this. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. So, anyways, I, like, got, like, a bartending license. I don't remember anything that I learned. Like, I... You know how to make a gin and tonic, for sure. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I really, I really... Because also, I don't drink a lot. And so, I, I, it's not, like, a big part of my life. I have this, like, bartending skills, in air quotes. And so, I was working for this, like, concession company that does a lot of theaters in New York. If you work, like, the main bar at, like, intermission, it's, like, crazy. Granted, you're not making, like, sex on the beach. It's just a lot of, like, wine pouring, and you might do some, some like, hard stuff. But, you know, you've got, like, 20 minutes and, like, huge lines, and I never wanted to do that. And the couple times I did, it was terrifying. So I would usually work, like, co-check 
So you'd get like some tips if you did coach hair. Or more often than not, at a lot of the theaters, especially like uh, uh, nonprofits like Roundabout, they have like VIP patron lounges, which is usually on another floor somewhere else. And like nobody goes in there. And I would work those and I would essentially stand behind a bar and there was no money exchanging hands because it was for VIPs. So you'd have like a white wine and a red wine and like a soda gun and some like free candy. And if they tipped you, amazing. But otherwise, you would just sort of like sit around and do nothing. But in the free ones, they had a bowl of Ferrero Rocher. Do you know what Ferrero Rocher are? They're like the hazelnut. Yep, they I know. Were, they're like, they're so good. And I also loved working in the VIP because I would usually like steal like a Ferrero every night. Uh, what theater was this? I'm going to report you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, let's not, uh, we, we won't get into that. Um, okay, you're joking and we're joking about getting this job at the theater bar because it's like, well, how do you be a designer? Oh, get a job at the theater bar. That's ridiculous. But I know that you and I both agree on this. A job is a job. And when you move somewhere, that's a great- I'm not saying don't get the job. I'm saying don't think that like bartending at a Broadway theater will get you a job in the Broadway industry. It doesn't work like that. We're not, we're not knocking those jobs. It was great for you and it'll be great for other people. Yeah. We're, we're not knocking them at all. I did it. The only reason I stopped doing it was because I got a job working for Ken Billington, which was a weekly paycheck. Suddenly my survival job and my design job were, became the same thing, which was always the goal. I always say, if you're going to get a survival job, think very closely about whether you want that survival job in the same industry that you're trying to work. If you're a lighting designer and you just work always as an electrician, you might have a harder time getting lighting design gigs because people know you as an electrician. Go work at a bowling alley and then there's like no crossover. People aren't going to make first impressions about you that you're then trying to recontextualize. Do you have any debts? I do not. Congrats. My parents started saving for my college tuition when I was born. They started saving for college uh, for 18 years. They planned out their mortgage so the house would be paid off right when I would be going to college. So they wouldn't be paying the mortgage and college at the same time. I went to an expensive school, did not have student loans. I, I am grateful for that every single day. Um, and anytime I get angry at my dad for sort of being tight-fisted, I remind myself that I moved to New York with no student loans and I owe them forever for that. If I were a parent, like, I don't know that I would have that sort of savings to pay for four years of an expensive college with no loans. But I'm not my dad and I did, you know, because I do spend more than he does. And that's, you know, that's obviously a, um, a decision to make. So, you know, it's weird to sometimes think that like, oh, I don't have debt, but like, like hypothetical children might have debt or student loans. I'm just not sure I'm prepared to live as, as close to the belt as my parents did. And here's the silly thing I always say, which is like, say you're born and you want to save for that person's college. If you save $5 a month, that's $60 at the end of the year. That's like nothing. Times 10 years, that's $600. Times 20 years, that's $1,200, which once again is nothing. But 1200 is more than zero. And $5 a month isn't always hard. If I had a kid, I would like try to start doing some version of that. To go back to your question, so I didn't, I didn't have student loans. My parents pay their credit card in full every month. The idea of sort of only paying for a portion of a bill was never an option in my house. Like you don't spend the money if you don't have the money to spend. And when I think I was in college, maybe at some point my parents got me, or maybe even before, uh, uh, you know, a debit card. And that was sort of the, and I think that's a really smart way to do it is you start a kid with a debit card. So they learn you can only spend what's in this account. You can't overdraft, you can't spend over. And then eventually I started getting credit cards, but I treat my credit cards like they're debit cards, which is I don't spend more than I have and I pay it off in full every month. And if I ever got to a point where I can't pay the credit card in full, then it means something is not in balance in my life. I, I actually am really glad you said that because there have been so many people, like your episode 44, there are so many people, I'm going to say 90% of the people I've talked to on this podcast talk about how horrible credit cards and getting into credit card debt is. It's really hard to talk about it without sounding arrogant about it. Like I'm, not, I'm absolutely not judging anyone who does have debt. You know, again, we have to acknowledge things like 
privilege. I, I'm an only child. Like I can't stress how much that mattered. All of my parents' income and savings was not being split among multiple people, you know, multiple kids. You know, it was just me. If they had to pay for two colleges versus one, that would have been a huge difference. And not only being an only child financially, but I was able to essentially explore whatever whims I wanted as a kid because my parents were able to drive me to dance class or acting class or puppetry class or whatever the hell I felt like doing because there weren't two kids to sort of share their time. That's privilege, you know, that's access. And so because of all those things, that's why I can say, you know, I am a person who doesn't carry debt, but I fully acknowledge the steps and the luck of just being born into into a certain uh, situation that has allowed me to live that life. I love that. So as a designer, do you have an entity, LLC, corporation or anything? Or is it just you, Corey Paddock? It's just me. To be perfectly honest with you, I don't even really know how those other things work. And I don't even necessarily know the reasons why you become an LLC or an escort or things like that. If it's something I need to do, it will present itself at some point. I don't run a studio. I rarely pay assistance out of my own pocket. If I do, it's not a lot. If I have assistance, they're generally being paid by the company, by the theater. Um, I don't employ sort of like draftsmen or people like that. I don't have payroll. Um, So it's just me. And so right now, it's just simple. It's just me. So does this mean that you get mostly 1099 income or do you also get W-2 income? Um, You know, I actually went back and looked at 2019 because I knew we were going to talk about this. uh, And it was about 80% 1099 and 20%. W-2. When I was doing associate work, which I haven't done in about six years now, um, but back when I was an associate, obviously I was getting much more W-2. You know, a Broadway associate is on a W-2. That also means national tour that, you know, any version of sort of a, of a production contract is a W-2. Now that I'm strictly designing, um, I get a couple W-2s from a couple theaters Uh, just because it's the way that they're set up. Obviously, if I was working in New York more, like off-Broadway New York, you know, is now all W-2. Yeah. Because you were mostly 1099, do you pay quarterly? I do pay quarterly. I didn't necessarily when I was an associate because I was making so much W-2, but I do pay quarterly. When I go in and meet with my accountant every year, what have you made so far this year? What do you know is coming up in the rest of the year? And so based on that, we come up with my quarterly numbers. And sometimes we even change those later in the year like for 2020 we didn't really know what was happening in march of 2020 um, or april of 2020 so then we connected again like in september to figure out what my estimates would be for fourth quarter and first quarter uh but yes i do pay the estimates sometimes it's a lot and it feels like a really big hit but i would rather spread out those payments than get a huge hit in uh in april which can be no fun Taxes. So now I want to talk about taxes because you and I have talked about taxes and itemizing off air. We have. I've researched this and I don't need to give a disclaimer because no one's paying me for my services, but I will give a disclaimer anyway, which is that we are not accountants. So any tax advice, don't listen to us. Go consult a professional. So the question is, do you file your own taxes? No, I have an accountant. I've had I have had an accountant since I graduated from college. For many years now, I've used Trudy Durant, which is a a tax office here in the city. They have experience working with a lot of performers, a a lot of like Broadway actors, but they also do designers and other artists. Uh, And I work with an amazing woman named Anne Adamowski who works in Trudy's office, and we've been working together for years. She does it all, and I'm incredibly grateful because it makes my life so much easier. Like paying for an accountant is not cheap. And I will say that that what I pay is kind of on the cheap end because I don't require a lot. I'm an individual. I come in very organized. So like I'm not getting hit with a lot of extra stuff. But even the baseline is not cheap. Every time I do it, I go like, like when I write the check, I'm like, oh, this is a lot. But it, it's so worth it. I just don't ever have to worry about it. I don't have to think about it. If you're a designer, I mean, I work 1099 and W2. I work in multiple states a year i do international work i do it's like it's so complicated that i can't even and my dad who's very very smart who does his own taxes and has always done his own taxes has been like i won't even know where to begin to do your taxes um and so to me it's just worth the money and if you're itemizing you can write it off the next year that's great and in fact every time we do itemize and go through the list we get to last year's tax prep and she's like i know what you paid us Uh, And then, you know, and then you write it off. Having an accountant, what do they expect from you when it's tax time? 
I think some people go in and they essentially hand them a shoebox of receipts. You can do that. I think it's going to cost you a lot more money. I try to make her job as easy as possible, which makes my life as easy as possible because it's a very quick, you know, it's a 20, 20, 30 minute meeting max a year. So what does she expect from me? Like I go in with a stack of all my 1099s that I've received from, you know, the theaters. Uh, that's like in one pile. I go in with a stack of all my W-2s. That's a different pile. If there's any sort of other things like uh, savings account interest or I IRA deposits, you know, those things matter. So there's like a stack of those. And then all the deductions. They have like a category list of deductions and I have used their list to build my own list. I have a number for each category and we go right through and she goes, what's your theater and film and TV viewing? It's blah, 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 blah. What's your office supply number? But And I just go down right and I go down to the list and read her the numbers and she knows where to put them and how to plug it in. And, and we do things like, well, what's your rent? Well, because I don't own a studio, I work out of my apartment. She's not taking the full percentage of my rent. I actually don't know what percentages she is taking of my rent or my utilities or, or my cell phone or things like that. But she knows what's legal. And so she knows how to do it. So I give her the full number and she does some percentage magic. And that's sort of it. Here's what I made and here's what I spent. And that's all she needs. I think what you illustrated there is that it's not actually that complicated. Like you said, 20, 30 minutes. I don't have a blog, but I'm working on a blog post about how do you do your taxes because it's actually really simple. It's like right now, I think I have eight steps. Gather your documents, find the tax person, go give them to them. Like it's really simple. What I find is the complicated part is the organizing and the itemizing. After my appointment's over, I'll call you when I when I know what you owe. And then I'll get a call a couple weeks later or something. I don't know how much time she spends with my numbers, filling out millions of forms that are required and putting in all the right numbers and the right things. But eventually she calls and she says, you owe this much federal, you owe this much state. You may have this, you know, you have a refund. What do you want to do with it? Uh, we say it's very quick. I don't want to discount her time. The reason it's very quick is because everything that I I have to, to take in, it's, it's like it's a living document. It's a thing that's always being addressed 365 days a year. So it's not like come tax time, I have to sit and throw all this stuff together. I mean, I have to sort of kind of do some totals, um, but that's essentially like a 15 minute task. Okay, so I wanna go through that list, that itemizing list with you. But first, you have a document. How do you organize your receipts? So what I used to do is I had a spreadsheet with multiple tabs. So there was one tab for earnings. Every job I have or think I have coming in and how much I expect to earn or how much I've already earned. Then I had a tab essentially that was just to keep track of utility of monthly payments. So rent, internet, quarterly stuff like union dues, quarterly health care dues. And then I had a deductible tab and each column is based on the categories they set. So again, there's office supplies, there's travel expenses, there's charitable donations. And as I spend things throughout the year, I would I just fill in the spreadsheet and then it calculates, you know, totals at the end and spits it out to sort of a summary page that I could then take into my appointment. I've done that for years and uh, some years back I started using Expensify, which is a online expense tracking program. I use the free account. And so anytime I had an expense that was business related, you email it to this email address and it just automatically puts it in your account or you can like scan the receipt and manually put it in. But I would only do that with business expenses. So I would have my Expensify and that's what I was using mainly to invoice theaters. You know, if you go to a regional theater, you have to turn in receipts for meals, you have to return in travel receipts and sometimes they're in different headings. In 2020, what I've done is essentially moved my entire life to Expensify and I'm trying to get rid of the spreadsheet and have it fully automated because you can connect your credit cards to Expensify. So every time your credit card runs, it sends that charge into Expensify. So I've moved all of those categories from my personal spreadsheet into Expensify categories and I've automated it as much as possible. If the merchant name is a certain thing, then it can file it under business expenses. Is this still the free version of Expensify? It's still the free version, yeah. Is it just your 
expenses or are you also adding your income there and your healthcare expenses? That's a really good question. So I have two main credit cards that I use. So I've connected both credit cards. I don't have a personal and business credit card. What I've done is it now sends every single thing to Expensify. So if I spend $3 on a taco and charge it, it's going to Expensify. I now have separate reports for business and personal. And the personal stuff, I just file personal and like I'll never look at it again. If you go on like bank websites, you can only go back and look at charges sometimes like up to two years. This will allow me to go back and look at charge by charge forever, essentially. I'm sending all the credit card transactions to Expensify. But then what I'm also doing is like if I get a check from a theater, I take the check image and I import that into Expensify. And that goes into a new report called earnings. So essentially, I now have three reports per calendar year, a business report, a personal report and an earnings report. And sometimes if I have expenses like estimated taxes, I'm scanning those checks in as well. Like it's, a, it's going in with like the personal stuff, but so I have a record of paying those. So I've tried to move it all to automated. 2021 will be the first year. We'll see how it goes. Okay, yeah, I was gonna say, so it sounds like 2020, you did a hybrid of Expensify and Spreadsheet. I started doing this right at the end of 2020 into 2021. So I'm no longer keeping my own spreadsheet. I'm no longer saving receipts. I've moved everything. It's all digital. It's all online. One of the things you get for more if, if you pay is like smart scanning where it like reads the receipt for you. On the free account, you only get like 25 uh, free smart scans. I don't care about like putting in the information myself. We'll see how it goes. I'm pretty excited so far about how well it's organizing it. Okay, so now the itemized list, I would just wanna go through, because I think people think itemizing, it's crazy, but it's really, at least for theater people, it's really just like 25 things. So I'm just gonna go through the list because you get one from your accountant. I made one up for myself that my accountant has never corrected. So, cabs and fares. Yeah, if it's just like me going to Trader Joe's and then coming home, like that Uber, you can't write that off. Usually the feeder is paying for most of my expenses to the airport. If there's something that the feeder is not reimbursing but is still considered business, yeah. And that includes like my subway passes. She takes a percentage of my subway costs. Um, okay, tax preparation. Yeah, obvious. Uh, so purchased movies and music. Technically, like any movie you watch or any music you listen to could be researched. We were just talking about Sherlock. Like, you know, any of that can be researched. If you're an artist, this is the world you live in. Those things are, are you can deduct those. Next item, tickets to theater and movies. Yeah, obviously. If you're, if you're going to see theater, going to see movies, that is part of your job. Business meals? Yeah, now I don't actually do that. You hit a ceiling of deductions, right? Where it's like, if you make X amount and you deduct so much it's a red flag for the irs um, right and you're more likely to get audited now the more you make potentially the more you can deduct my account is really good at figuring out those deductions and essentially we've sort of hit a wall in terms of we can't really deduct anymore i don't keep track of all of my business meals because i don't necessarily need those additional deductions because we're kind of already there and my advice i'm sort of the same way if it's an expensive business meal which i rarely do that's when i will write down who i'm with and what we're talking about and again i'm talking about stuff sort of outside like if i'm working at a regional theater if you're at a lort theater you get an expense budget essentially that you can turn in receipts for and so usually my meals when i'm working most of them fall under that reimbursable expense budget anyways. Um, next item is business gifts. Especially when I work on Broadway, like you, when you buy opening night gifts for people, sometimes they're significant. Or if you buy something for the stage door a guy or the stage manager or, or whoever, you know, you get stuff for the follow spot ops. Those sorts of like opening night gifts, those are deductible. Two categories here, medical expenses and medical insurance premiums. Right, so I get my health insurance through the union, those quarterly payments. But then also there are things like co-pays and lab results and other just specialist things, and you might have to pay for those. Those unreimbursed medical expenses are dedu also deductible. We talked about this already, home office. A part of my rent is deducted, as are any office supplies or anything that relates to doing my job from my home office. Advertising and website fees. This is one I didn't actually know about. Oh yeah, and that's huge for me because I've got my personal website through Squarespace. 
I've got a media host for my podcast episodes. I've got a different host for the podcast website itself, not the not the media. I'm paying for two different domains for the podcast, and so all of those things are deductible. Um, union dues. Yep, easily. Uh, software, which is separate from the websites. There are things like you know I pay for an Adobe subscription. Um, I don't pay for Vectorworks because I'm a beta tester. But if I did pay for Vectorworks, that would be that would be part of that. Printing and postage. Yep. Coaching, professional training. That's another one I didn't really think about. There's been a couple times in my life where I've like asked someone, "Hey, I don't know how to use a hog. Can you like teach me how to use a hog?" And I'll pay you. 200 bucks for an hour or something or two hours i've deducted that i also don't know how to use a hog so that didn't work fees to assistants or accompanists also agents and managers so all of my agent commission is a uh, is deductible and like if you and i are doing a show and the theater is paying you 1500 dollars, and i say i'm going to pay you another 500 dollars um that that my 500 that's deductible okay here's one that i thought was old-fashioned but i have a thought on trade publications what i use that for is like online stuff like i have a new york times subscription i have a new york magazine subscription that's like for vulture and things like that that's where i put that stuff you're not an expert but i'm thinking if somebody becomes a patron at patreon.com slash artistic finance i feel like that's a trade publication i think you could make that argument i like how you work that in <laughs> um that could be true i mean it also used to be things like Back in the day, I would pay for like a Lighting Dimensions subscription. Um, nowadays, most things like live design and do people pay for that? I actually don't know. I don't pay for them. I think I think most of us get them sort of gratis. Uh, but I, I I do see price tags on the cover, so someone must pay for them. I don't. Know. But like if you subscribe to like Architectural Digest or you know any, anything that's informing your work, that's deductible. Um, makeup for performers. Uh, don't do that. Publicity tickets? Yeah, this is a big one. If you're a designer and you have a show in New York, a lot of times directors will say, hey, tell me when you have a show. Um, I'd love to see your work. And you might get two comps and you might have five directors who want to, you know, who you want to come see your work. You might have like a discount code, but you don't want to ask them to pay for the ticket. So you might pay $25 for a ticket for, and they don't even have to know. You can say, I arranged a ticket for you. It's at the box office. Maybe you paid for it. Uh, that's deductible. Um, here's another one I didn't know. Backstage tips. Yeah, you know, people tip. This is less for us, but, you know, performers, they tip dressers uh, uh, quite significantly often. You know, um, it's very common, especially if you're like a principal actor who's been with a dresser for years. Um, they might get like a weekly tip from you. There's holiday tips. You might tip, uh, like, again, a stage door person. But but it's saying if I pay the tip, I can deduct that. Yeah. Or is it the reverse? Yeah. OK. No, no, I'm saying like if you're if, if you're Sutton Foster and you're and you're tipping your dresser every Friday night, you're a hundred bucks a week or something, you could write that off. Hardware, equipment and luggage. Obviously anything I use for travel, of which I do a lot of suitcases, duffel bags, um, hardware, sea wrenches, I mean anything, sure. Um this one doesn't really apply to us so much, but auto expenses. I mean I know Ken mentioned if he has to go to a shop, he'll like chart you know, he'll keep track of the gas uh, and bill the show. Technically, I guess if you're billing a show and getting reimbursed for it, you can't also deduct it? Correct. That Yes, that is accurate. So I guess if there's a transportation expense that the theater is not paying for, you could write that off. Like if you own your own car and you go through tolls. Or if you have to pay, if you have to pay for inspection because the car is how you get to work, you know, I assume that's deductible. Business travel to like a convention separate from working out of town. Yeah, sure. If, if I went to LDI, I could write off every part of that. Or I, I've done things like site visits or like, hey, I'd love to have a meeting with you. I'm going to be in this city. You know, any costs that might be related. If I take a subway to some other theater, you know, in another city, I could write that off. Um, and then the final one, charitable contributions. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you're making, I made political contributions last year during our uh, they weren't large, but, uh, you know, that stuff is tax deductible. You get a letter sometimes saying, like, here's proof of your donation for, for tax purposes. I Okay, so we're going to go through out-of-town itemizing, but I would just like to say that, Corey, welcome. You and I just made the most boring episode of this podcast ever by going over that list. I mean, I've been <laughs> making the most boring episodes for seven years, so um, that's nothing new. <laughs> but what I love about the last 10 minutes that we took to take to go over that is it's actually not that complicated. People are like, I'm just going to take the standard deduction, not worry about all that. Yeah. We just went over it. And yes, getting that spreadsheet organized or Expensify to organize it is a little complicated, but we literally just went over every single deduction you can take. So it's it's not crazy.
I'm not sure if I'm if I should say this or not, but I will, which is like I went again, I went back and looked at my 2019 returns because we've been having to do that for various unemployment things. Essentially, my 1099 gross income, which is before taxes, was essentially halved after my deductions. If X was my gross, my net was X divided by two. I owed a lot less money after those deductions. It was a significant the amount that was left was nearly equal to what we deducted. So there are still a couple more things to itemize for theater people who work out of town. So out of town itemizing, number of days away, and if you received per diem. I just know that if I received per diem from the, from the company, which I do, I believe, and I'm not an expert, I believe that like, again, you can't double dip and also take a, a standard city deduction or state deduction because you were receiving a per diem. If you work in Lort Regional Theater, you don't typically receive a per diem. If you work on like a production contract, like a Broadway tour or or something more like that, you're more likely to receive a per diem. So if it's like a Lort show, I will just give my accountant a list and say, I worked in Connecticut for seven days. I worked in Utah for 23 days. I worked, and then she, I don't actually know what she does, but there's a booklet and I think it gives you standard deductions for states. And she just uses that to essentially account for the missing per diem. Yeah, and all these out-of-town expenses are only deductible if you're not reimbursed for them. If you're not reimbursed. And, and right, and that's why I'm saying like, if, if I'm doing a Broadway show out of town and I'm getting per diem, I'm not telling her those days. Because I tell them the days, but then I say it doesn't count, you know, or got per diem or whatever. Um, hotels is the next category there. Yeah, I mean, I'm rarely paying for my own housing, the theater is, but if I ever had to, that would be, you know, that would be deducted. Um, and then meal expenses. And again, if you're working in a Lort theater, depending on whether it's Lort A, B, C, D, B+, plus, things like that, if you're a member of the union, there is a personal re reimbursement expense line, which I use for meals. You can use it for whatever you want. You know, it might be something like $200, $150, $300. If you want to go out for one really good steak meal and spend $150, you can do that. But essentially, you can turn in receipts up to that number, and the theater will reimburse you for it. I use them primarily for meals. And I'm even crazy. I like sort of keep track of that number throughout the week. And it's like, if it's like my last day in town and I've got like 50 bucks left that I haven't used, it's like, let's go out for a nice dinner because theater, it's, theater's going to pay for it. Um, next category is car rental, gas, parking, and tolls included. Yep. Yep. Um, um, and then air, rail, and bus. Yeah. Again, generally speaking, the theater is p paying for all of it. If they haven't, I'm turning in the receipts and they're reimbursing. So that stuff I'm not deducting because the theater is paying, paying me back for it. Um, okay. So we just went through all itemizing, all deductions. Boom. And while it was super boring, <laughs> it wasn't complicated. Like it wasn't overly complicated. So if you think you should be itemizing or deducting, think about getting your spreadsheet organized because it's really not crazy complicated. But if the IRS comes knocking on your door, don't tell them it's because <laughs> we told you you could do it. We, we are not experts here. I mean, the thing is, I almost don't even recommend people getting an accountant. I obviously do recommend that. But I also say, like, you can do it on your own. The thing is, when you go to do it on your own and realize that you have to figure out where those deductions go, that's when you're going to throw in the towel and be like, yes, I'm going to pass this off to someone. If I ever were to get audited, my accountant is a part of that audit. They are there with me, whether it's something that, a mistake that they've made or something that they've done that was not technically allowed. With the accountant, you have a, you have a partner in the audit. And I appreciate that as well. What financial advice would you give yourself back when you started your career or would you give to somebody else that's starting right now? A, keep your overhead as low as possible. If you're going to move to New York or if you're going to sort of start this, you know, try to start it with a safety net. That might mean working a survival job for six months to have a little something to start with. If you need a survival job, just to make ends meet, to pay your rent, to do everything at the beginning, that is invariably going to take away from the time you have to go work on your passion, on your art. And so you need to find a way to uh, have your survival job not overtake your life. And the only way you can do that is by having some sort of savings. And you do that through a combination of saving in advance and then keeping your overhead low in, in the present. What can you and I do to stress the importance of savings and finance to our fellow artists? I mean, I think we're doing it. Um, I think talk about it. We have to talk about it. When I talk to students or do like master classes, I encourage them, like, ask about money. Um, what do you want to know? Do you know how much a Broadway designer makes? Do you know how much a Broadway assistant makes? Do you know what a typical regional theater fee is for a lighting designer? All of these 
things are hard numbers. Like you can always negotiate more, but the union sets minimums for all of this and they shouldn't be a secret. Um, and so anyone who's interested in coming into this industry should have access to all of those numbers. I mean, I've even told people what I make, literally, here's what I made this year. We have to get rid of the taboo about talking about money because people come into this business not knowing what they're in store. They don't know how to be prepared for this because no one's told them how much they might make in the first couple years of doing this. Um, and that's not fair to people who've just spent all that money on schooling and money to move to New York. We have to give people the information so they can act accordingly. So I think we just have to talk about it. I love that. And also, I've gotten some feedback on this podcast of people being like, well, ask them how they, much they make on a certain job, et cetera, et cetera. But the Broadway rate sheets are public. So you can go see what a designer like. Yeah, I'm not sure. Can you can you get them on the union website if you haven't logged in? That's what I'm not sure about. So if you're not supposed to publicly get them, they are available online, regardless of that. Any any designer that's like trying to hide what the minimums are is being stupid. Like we should all be willing to share those numbers. But but what I'm saying is they are public. So it's not like they're hidden. But nobody does talk about it because it is taboo. But if you've listened to my podcast, you know, uh, I don't know the minimum, so I'm not going to say it because I want to say it's like 15000 for a play. But but you know that there's a minimum, which is very often what producers will offer. And then you know that I've had really established designers whose fee is double the minimum. So right there, you can see like... I can tell you that a Broadway associate you know, minimum right now, it, it was 1500 something for a while. It's like, like 1610 or 1625. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you what I made as a Broadway associate, but like we can tell people what the minimums are. I mean, that, that, that's the, the most basic thing we can do is, is provide those non-secret numbers. Like you said. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing is they're non-secret because equity, you can go find out what equity, because if you're producing a show, you have to be able to go see what's this going to cost me. So they make these rate sheets available to the producers. So you can just look it up. You can go look at a theater. You can look it up. Oh, they're a Lort B plus. Then you can go look up how much is a Lort B plus minimum for a costume designer. And then you'll know right away, you would not make less than this. In regional theater, most people are not making above minimum. You know, everyone's sort of, at least in my experience, making the minimum. But in commercial theater, certainly Broadway, things like that, people, like you said, are, are often making well above minimum. And if you're a big designer, yeah, you could be making double. Which job of yours has been the most financially lucrative for you? Uh, it was the cruise ship. Uh, uh, I did a cruise ship show in 2019, and it was uh, well and beyond. the and, and even like above associate gigs, um, which is rare because associate often pays more over time. Uh, I'd love to do another cruise ship show for that reason. Um, you know, they pay really well, uh, certainly more more than theater. So, so far, that's been the best. Okay, so we're crunched for time. So I'm actually going to skip to the very end. Um, Corey, what separates those that have a full-time career in the arts from those that never get started in it or do it for a while and then go do something else? I think it's about some of the things we talked about. It's it's about access. It's about resources. It's about privilege. The fact that I was able to move to New York with some money, the fact that I didn't have student loan debts, the fact that I knew some people already here, um, all of those things cumulatively, I think, determine success versus not success. It's everything, networking, who you know, privilege, resources, what your parents' financial situation is. Can you find an apartment? You know, my apartment that I've lived in for many, many years, the rent has amazingly stayed very close to what it originally was. You know, that has helped me be able to take a job that doesn't pay a lot because my overhead is low. Um, I think having a low overhead, which we haven't talked about, is really important. Find find the areas of your life that you can save on to keep that overhead low. So I think it's a it's a kaleidoscope of 50 different things, and it's hard to pinpoint one of them. Final question, where can people find out more about you? So my website is coreypaddock.com. My Instagram is at Corey Panic. Uh, the podcast is in onepodcast.com. You can listen to the podcast on iTunes, on Spotify, on Stitcher. I guess that's sort of it. I don't have any things running. Corey, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Ethan. It was great being here. That was our interview with Corey Paddock. My takeaways were avoid credit card debt. If you don't have the money, don't purchase the item. Having someone who knows about finance help you with your finances is ideal, even if they aren't a certified expert. You don't have to learn everything for yourself. Discuss with people that know or have experience. And finally, be organized. Corey is organized with his receipts, 
and his meeting with his tax preparer takes all of 30 minutes. The additional discussion from today's interview is over on Patreon. You can become a big-time producer of this show for as little as $3 a month. Do that at patreon.com slash artistic finance. And as always, if you're a designer and you want to hear the rest of today's conversation, but you aren't ready to become a patron, email me at artisticfinancepodcast.gmail.com and I'll send you the audio directly. Before I let you go, and if you'd be so kind, please remember to subscribe to the podcast. If you're feeling particularly jovial, or if you've had the correct amount of gin and tonic, please tell someone about this show. That's the way most people have found us, so if you find the show worthwhile, Share it with the artist in your life. That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Find more information on our website, artisticfinance.com. Please subscribe to our podcast and please leave a rating and review. Artistic Finance is produced in New York City by Nicole and Ethan Steinle. Producing consultant Ann Nygren Doherty. Graphics and website by Josh Cutler. Music by Chong Liu.